change. When I was in my 20s, I changed careers from computer engineer to stand-up comedian. It was the 1980s, and I decided I'm a visionary. I could see the future. This whole computer thing is going nowhere. <laughs> but, you know, for a long time, I've had to answer to a lot of folks who feel that there's some kind of inherent contradiction between those two pursuits, and I don't think there is. So if you'll indulge me, I'd like to talk a little bit about why. I'm going to start with a story from when I was nine years old, and my grandmother took me to the New York World's Fair. They had an exhibit there, it was part of the IBM Pavilion, that demonstrated the bell curve, the Gaussian distribution, mechanically. There's, I have a picture of the machine, which is a brilliant thing that was invented by Charles and Ray Eames. Uh, it dropped 30,000 balls from the top through this grid of pegs, and each ball in each row would bounce randomly left or right, and when they all collected at the bottom, every time they would form a perfect bell curve and match the line you see painted on the front there. And this just blew my little mind. I could not be dragged away. Here we are at this giant fair, and there's rides and shows and food, and my grandmother is stuck with this creepy, obsessed child <laughs> who will not be torn away from the math machine. But I, honestly, it was, a, it, was a, it was like a life-changing thing for me. It really was. And, and I... I I, I would focus in, you know, like on one little ball and watch it just be completely random, and then I'd kind of zoom out and see that every time there was this pattern to it, and it, it made me realize that you could make sense out of something by looking at it in a different way. And I think that's something that engineers and comedians both do. Okay, are you with me so far? Okay. The, the numbers and jokes have always been a part of my life from the time I was a kid. I was memorizing Pi to 50 places and Bill Cosby albums, you know, it's just... And you can infer from the time commitment that took, I didn't have a massive social life at the time. <laughs> I, uh, I, I looked up numbers in the dictionary, I just thought numbers were interesting, I looked up just to see what would the dictionary say. And I found the word 50, F-I-F-T-Y, it's in there, the definition was three words, five times ten. <laughs> Now, you don't know what 50 is. What kind of help is 5 times 10? <laughs> well, you look up 49, it'll say C50, subtract 1. <laughs> in any event, I did grow up to become an engineer. I went to work for a mainframe manufacturer in New Jersey, which was fantastic. It was, mind it was like Oz to me. I got to play with these giant computers. It was like the ultimate mega probability machine. It was fantastic. I was, in fact, I have a picture. I think this is from like 1979 or 1980, if we can get there, let's see. Yes, that's it, that's me and my group. You can kind of play Where's Waldo with this and try to figure out who I am. The, the clue is there's no female in that picture. I, uh... Little randomness going on with the hair there, too, I think. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh... <laughs> I was a... I was a very early version of the crazy programmer. I was, you know, socially awkward, hyper-caffeinated, pulling all-night coding marathons, and basically kind of Mark Zuckerberg without the money, if you want to think of it <laughs> that way. And, uh, I, and I... But I started moonlighting as a, as a comic. I was going out, and let's get rid of that, oh my god. I started going out and, and I, was, I was doing my engineering job by day and going out at night and trying to tell jokes. And what I discovered, it was, and it was surprising to me, uh, the, it was the same, I couldn't do both at once because it was the same creative juice that was fueling both of these things. I'd squeeze that lemon so hard all day doing programming, I couldn't get out and, and be funny at night. So I quit my day job, became a comedian, did all the TV shows, next thing you know, I'm touring all over the place, and in every town I would do these interviews, and every time they wanted to write the exact same story, which was, you know, nerd loser engineer, blossoms into fabulous TV comedian, it's impossible, how can that be, it's so crazy, it's, it's an ugly duckling, it's a caterpillar, a butterfly, it just couldn't be. And I, having no character at all, played right along. Well, I looked around the office and I realized I was the only one with a personality, uh, you know. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's a cheap joke and 
and it's just not true. The people I worked with were creative and smart and funny and great, you know, and, and I think when we pigeonhole people like that, it makes me think of the bell curve again, because you take the, the distribution of possibilities of everything somebody could be, we collapse it down to this one thing that's the average in the middle, we decide that's our answer and we move on. And more often than not, just mathematically even, we're just wrong. And I think it affects the way we, we see ourselves and the way we see other people. There was a story about, uh, there was a study, it was like, I think it was in 2007, it got a lot of attention about American high school girls and math. And they said that the girls weren't pursuing math in the United States as much as in other countries and as much as the boys because they felt that being good at math was a masculine quality. It's that same stereotype. And by the way, I would have loved to have known that because I was in high school. I was amazing at math. <laughs> I don't recall any girl ever expressing any idea that she felt it was a masculine quality. I'll just say. <laughs> but if I could, I would go back to those same reporters and try to give them the, the real answer to the question, why, why is an engineer and a comedian, what, what do they have in common? And the truth is, an engineer, if you think about it, they take a big complicated thing like a the airplane or a bridge or a computer and they break it down into its little parts and they break the parts down into littler parts and they figure out kind of how everything fits together and meshes and jibes. And when you apply that kind of analysis to life and the world, what falls out is the inconsistencies and contradictions and paradoxes and those are the jokes. And much of what I do, I'm often starting off with a science question. When my wife was pregnant, we, uh, we had to have the amniocentesis. And I asked the doctor, well, how does this work? I have a background in science. Explain it to me. He said, well, we get some cells, we grow them in a dish, when we have enough of them, we can tell if the baby's gonna be okay. I said, how long does that take? And he said, I swear to God, 14 business days. <laughs> and what kind of a cell takes the weekend off from multiplying? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, it's Veterans Day, the banks are closed, there's no mitosis on a day like this. And pseudoscience stuff is ripe for this kind of, and I love to go after these, the crop circle thing. If you look at that, you know the story, big pattern crunched into a cornfield in England, and what people believe is that it, it's, it's gotta be aliens. They actually believe, if you look at it, they, they will say, it's a, the pattern is so big you can see it from space, they're leaving each other messages. This is what they, messages. Is this remotely plausible? Do we have to think that much further? What are the chances that this is a race of advanced alien super beings who have mastered intergalactic hyperdimensional space travel and communicate by corn? <laughs> they just cannot get the Blackberry thing together. So, you know, I, I, let me just say this, those stereotypes that I'm talking about, I think th these things are ephemeral and the proof is, look at how it's changed. The time that I quit my job to go be a comedian, at that time, being a computer programmer was the dumbest, boringest, you know, the computer, who needs that? Why would you have some boring, stupid thing? You're gonna be a comedian, really? What's that, how do you do that? Where are you gonna go? How, do you, how does that happen? Are you gonna go on the Johnny Carson show? Tell me more. Today, Bill Gates is the sexiest man alive. <laughs> And when you say, I'm a comedian, people go, oh yeah, my sister's ex-husband did that for a little while. <laughs> so just, I'll leave you with this. What I think I learned from the probability machine is that if you, if you want to simplify things, instead of limiting your view, the best way, the fun way, is to find the patterns and the combinations that naturally occur when you look at all the possibilities. Thank you very much.